Hi, everyone. Last talk of the day, so hard job for me. Um, today, uh, in this talk, I want to discuss about uh, anti-patterns, especially microfrontends anti-patterns, because, um, you know, quite a few people uh, have thought that when a uh, distributed system on the front end uh, came out, now they were the silver bullet, and everyone can use them, and they should use them, and so on and so forth. And moreover, uh, we started to apply, uh, let's say, common practices that we have done in the past with single page applications or uh, uh, server-side rendering application. Or whether uh, the distributed system in general is different, we need to shift our mindset. In this talk, I, want, uh, I collected uh, several anti-patterns that I have uh, experienced either, um, uh, let's say, uh, hands-on when I was working in the trenches, or when I started to consult hundreds of customers from New Zealand to Silicon Valley uh, in the last three years. So, let's start. One thing that uh, uh, I discovered during my onboarding in, in AWS uh, is this one. So there is no compression algorithm for experience that he was said by our CEO, uh, Andy Jesse. And total, I totally agree with this sentence because uh, the reality is when you start to have, uh, uh, let's say, experiences and you see how the things are working, why it's working, what's not, uh, you understand uh, uh, what are the capabilities and, and the things that you can really uh, have with the technology, architecture, you pick it, uh, that you have in, in front of you. So it's very important uh, for me trying to distill what I have seen the last eight years uh, in, in this talk. Who am I? My name is Luca. I'm a serverless specialist. I'm based in London. Uh, I work for AWS. And uh, I'm an international speaker and a book's author. So let's start uh, first with benefits. I don't want just to shoot to my front ends, considering that uh, I have seen uh, uh, pros and cons of this, this uh, technology. Sorry, architecture. First of all, one of the benefits that many people are looking for is incremental upgrades. I want to have independent teams that are capable to deploy their front ends at their own piece uh, uh, and with reducing as much as possible external dependencies. That's definitely something that resign extremely well uh, with people that are uh, working with, uh, with front ends. And probably, especially from the technical perspective, is one of the key reasons why people are moving in to uh, microfront hands. The second, uh, the second benefit uh, uh, is decentralization. So up to now, when we were working on, uh, uh, let's say, large systems on front end, what was happening, whatever framework or uh, uh, tools or libraries you were using, the reality is after a few years, you start to uh, stop to innovate or you start to slow down the development. It's not because you don't understand anymore how to code. Probably you understand even better. But the reality is, uh, in order to have a cohesive and coherent um, code base, you need to, uh, at some point, slow down because you cannot, uh, let's say, um, uh, explain all the uh, decision why certain things were made to all the new joiners. People are coming to your team. People are leaving your team, and so on and so forth. And now, the concept of decentralization is quite key in uh, uh, the distributed system world. Front end, back end, doesn't matter. And here, we, there is a shift of mindset where we start to empower the developers to have skin on, uh, in the game. And what I mean with that is that finally, you have some guardrails and guidelines that usually are provided uh, to a team, and then developer can start to work uh, with them. And the most important thing is they can make decisions. They can select the right library for the job. They can take the right uh, solution for, for the specific problem that they are solving. The other cool thing of microfrontends is the uh, reduction of uh, cognitive load. Cognitive load uh, it was uh, highlighted uh, uh, quite extensively in one of the uh, book of, of Team Topologies, for instance. Uh, and uh, the, the reason behind that is we want with distributed system to reduce the cognitive load for the team so now they don't have to know 
everything in uh, every single corner and edge case of the application. Now the team is responsible for a portion of the application of bounded cost context or subdomain, depends how you want to call it, uh, and they, are, uh, they know that inside out. That leads also to a faster um, onboarding of your new joiners because now they have to, know, to understand only the things that are happening inside their bounded context and not uh, everywhere else. And last but not least, remember that uh, the a distributed system is not only a technology decision. As every architecture, architecture goes hand in hand with uh, the organization structure and the culture. Those three things, every time that you make a decision on one of those three things, are affecting the other two. And there is no way to avoid that. Therefore, remember that selecting monorepo or polyrepo is not just a technology choice is the way how your teams are going to communicate from that point onwards. So let's start with the, with the anti-pattern. That is the uh, main reason why I'm here today. So I start with the first one I call the yin and the yang. Or the main anti-pattern that I've seen here is the difference between microfrontends and components. Because, big spoiler, they are not the same. So let's start with the example of a component. Let's pick the probably the exemplification of a component, the button. And the button, in this case, has a label. So you can't set the label. You just, uh, um, let's say, define the label of the button, done. Suddenly, there is a new requirement. So now you have uh, also the possibility to have or not uh, a, an icon. Then your button starts to have success inside the company. So in another portal, uh, they want to use it, but they want to change the border color, so you start to expose that. And then uh, they want to have a different rollover animation. And then they want to have auto size dimension because now your button is using uh, multiple uh, portals with multiple languages. And last but not least, they want to de disable the button. So you have a bunch of capabilities of your component that are exposed to someone else. That usually, all of these are driven by the container of the component. The component is just exposing the capabilities, but it's the container that is owning the context. And that's exactly where Microfrontends kicks in. This is a definition that I uh, coined uh, in uh, 2016. So it's, uh, it's been a while that it's around, and, and quite few uh, people in the community are rallying behind that. And the interesting part here uh, are these two characteristics of the, the, this, this, this definition. So microphone tents are a technical representation of a piece of subdomain. What I mean with that is taking the learnings from domain-driven design, we know that the complexity of uh, building a system uh, is uh, not only uh, a, a job for developers. We need to have the business uh, close to the developers. They need to communicate and express and, and define how the things are going to work uh, in order for the developers to translate this requirement into production code. In the case of microphone tense, there is awareness of the context. There isn't like the, in the component that you can use as a Swiss army knife wherever you want. And moreover, it, there is another thing. You want to achieve independent implementations. That is one of the key uh, goals why you are looking uh, into microphone tense. And therefore, uh, in order to uh, reach that, you need to reduce the external dependencies. Very often, when you, uh, let's say, uh, um, confuse microphone tents and components, you, reach, you risk that there is, you create a lot of coupling between teams. So you create external dependencies that are not surfacing maybe in the first iteration, but after a few of them. So if we look about the microphone tent, the characteristic is that it is independent. So a team can independently deploy it uh, at, at their own piece. Sometimes of course, there are some, some communication across teams, but the reality is uh, you want to uh, deploy independently. Second thing is domain aware. Usually, a microphone tent needs really few information. For instance, they need that where to find uh, the uh, session token, or uh, uh, which is the favorite language for the user that maybe is stored inside local storage, or the ID of the product that the user wants to load that is on the query string, and they will handle it uh, for all the rest. They define input and output, vast majority of time events. If you're familiar with, for instance, uh, the, um, even driven architectures, 
you can think about that the way how you should communicate between micro frontends, but we will see in a moment. And usually they tend to be not too much extensible. The reusability of micro frontends sometimes can be challenging because it's not a component that you want to reuse everywhere and the context is driven by the container. The container of a micro frontend is unaware of the context. It's the micro frontend itself that knows that. So bear in mind that when you find yourself in a situation that you call it micro frontends, I would call a distributed mess, because in this case, we are going to have a lot of external dependencies, a lot of uh, uh, communication, and basically you are defeated the, all the effort for building a distributed system. So when you find yourself in that situation, ask yourself, are you designing micro frontends or components? The next anti-pattern is called Hydra of Lerna. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, one of uh, uh, probably the second most offender for micro frontends, the multi frameworks approach. Very, so many people are, uh, have thought that micro frontends are a good way for doing something like that. Now, um, I would argue that, uh, you know, uh, despite you can do that, you shouldn't do that. And I would, li I would like to ask you a question. How many of you, when they are designing a single page application, are using multiple UI libraries or frameworks? Raise your hand. There is one over there. Two. OK. So that tells you that when you have multiple UI libraries and multiple frameworks, you are, to a certain extent, penalizing certain kind of users. Because technically, you can do with a single page application. But the reality is we, need, we know that we want to optimize for networking. There are in certain countries where the infrastructure is not as great as it could be here in Poland or in any other countries. And therefore, uh, maybe even the internet connection on, on mobile is not as great as you expect. And you want to provide a snappy experience to your users. And therefore, performance matters. There are situations, though, where having this capability can really help you. For instance, when you are dealing with legacy system, if you are migrating from a monolithic architecture to micro frontends, and uh, um, you, for certain, uh, for many reasons, you want to move away from the old version of your um, uh, framework and moving to another UI framework, you can do that, and that is the one of the feats knowing upfront that is going to be temporary. It's not that you are optimizing your design and architecture for uh, this, this approach. The second thing is the migration to a new UI framework. Imagine that you're using an old version of Angular and you want to move to the new version of Angular. You could approach uh, with, with micro frontends and then slowly but steadily, uh, let's say, replacing portion of the page uh, one after the other. We, we will talk about migration uh, later on. And last but not least, I have seen, and I didn't, uh, I didn't think about that, but that's the reality. Following a few customers, I've seen uh, quite a few customers that they uh, started to think about micro frontends for capitalizing the investment. So after acquiring a new company, they have obviously some software. They want, you want to have a return of investment as soon as possible. And therefore, what they did is using uh, this approach for ha combining uh, two words, basically. So when, uh, um, when you think about multi-frameworks, always ask yourself, is it appropriate? But ten, I, I highly recommend to think about your users. It's not a, a, a playground for developers that we are building here. We are building a solution for our customers, so we have to squeeze in our head that every line of code matters and is very important for our customers. The next one is called the Swiss Army Knife, or uh, write programs that do one thing and do it well. I'm old enough to have played heavily with Unix, and uh, I love the way how they, you, you design a program. You just have a, a program that does one thing and connects perfectly inside the, the ecosystem. And that's exactly what we should think about. So now let's take this example that is a real example. So imagine there is a company that started a greenfield project with microfrontends. So now we have this container that usually is an application shell. Uh, and that's how we call it. And it loads uh, what they call a vertical microphone tent. So one microphone tent that represents one or multiple pages. And then at some point, we need to build uh, another um, uh, microphone tent, uh, better view, that contains two microphone tents. Because in this case, we're going to have a bunch of different subdomains that are communicating together, we want to display inside the same uh, view. 
Those obviously need to communicate. So in this case, we are going to use an event emitter for communicating and not uh, anything else. And last but not least, we decided to store our token, session token, into the um, local storage. So by convention, microfrontends know that they need to uh, retrieve there and all good. Suddenly, there is an acquisition. And uh, the business really wants to have the legacy editor uh, into uh, this new uh, application. The problem is that I have seen uh, customers uh, doing was, OK, let's take this. And uh, now we decided to have event emitter everywhere. We decided to have certain convention inside the architecture. We need to change the application shell in a way that fits the bill with this one. And what I mean for that is, uh, in, the, in this specific scenario, they decided to go with an iframe for isolating everything, great. But the problem is they, they started to, to change the code of the application shell. And that's a problem. And the problem mainly is um, that I start to have code that at some point will be thrown away the moment that I have the legacy editor rewritten with the same architecture. And therefore, there is a fantastic pattern that's called anti-corruption layer that in uh, the domain-driven design community is very uh, familiar with that basically suggests to um, create a layer for the communication between two systems. Usually, you use that when you want to do uh, a migration from an old system to a new system so we can do the same. We wrap our microphone end in a container that is an anti-corruption layer. And what it does is that, that this iframe is communicating with this anti-corruption layer, not with the application shell directly. And and suddenly, you are aligned with your decision because you are sanitizing the communication uh, with your legacy editor. When you're ready and you have the new application, you just remove the uh, anti-corruption layer, and suddenly, you can immediately deploy uh, to the application shell the new version without any problem. That is, uh, a, let's say, a good way for uh, being bull bulletproof and also handling this kind of situation. So, Bear in mind, usually it's a good sign when the application shell is defined and you invest at the beginning time for building that, but then you don't touch it. It means that you really uh, have nailed the design of your, of your system because the, the application shell uh, shouldn't, should be low maintenance. So it should, let's say, just uh, uh, working normally. Now, let's talk about another one that I really love, uh, the dependencies hell. So this is a, when I was talking before about dependency management, um, we need to be aware of, of a situation like that with microphone tents because now it's not anymore I update a package JSON done and the whole application has the new library. Now we have potentially a library that is spread across multiple teams, multiple um, microphone tents and so on. So let's imagine in this example that we have a core library 1.1. So brand new version of the core library because we understood that we need this core library. It's absolutely fundamental. It will speed up everyone. And um, one, the first thing that you notice is obviously you have a new library, but unless you have a strong governance for handling that, it doesn't mean that uh, all the teams will have the same version. So when you release 1.2.0, maybe Microphone 10A has the latest version, but the other two don't. Is it fine for you? Is it something that you can live with that or not? That's the first question that you need to ask yourself. But it could be even worse, and I have seen that. And this one is, is, is even better. So let's imagine we have our core library, but the microphone 10, the uh, B team is uh, saying, OK, I think I can, let's say, extend my core library, adding new functionality to it. So we have all of them have 1.1.0, core library extended has 1.1.0, and then uh, everything is fine. OK? Now suddenly, a change is required. So now the core library is 2.1. So there was a breaking change of uh, the APIs. The other microphone tents, given or take, are updated uh, at the same time. Unfortunately, the core library now has to upgrade to the version 2.1.0 and update the uh, code in order to make that working. So the problem, unfortunately, scales with the number of shared libraries that you're going to use. It's not an easy one if you think about that. It's not, you have like an immediate benefit, but a long run uh, uh, problem. So if you really, really, really need to do something like that, work by composition. So in JavaScript, you can do that very easily. So don't extend, compose. 
And that's for me the key thing, but moreover, try to understand if you have to share that code and how often is the rate of change, how often you're going to, uh, let's say, um, uh, if you need to duplicate, if you need to, uh, to abstract or not. Usually a, a good rule of thumb that I've seen working pretty well is unless is something that is screaming, please share it, like the design system, try to understand if first you build it, maybe you duplicate, and when there is the third occasion of, of uh, uh, rebuilding the, this specific thing, you start to look what are the, uh, let's say, uh, what are the, the governance process and if you can abstract it, uh, and so on and so forth. It's very important that you take a pragmatic approach because every library will require you in the long run to maintain code is liability. Let's not forget about that. Next one is a return ticket, please, or the unidirectional data flow to the rescue. So in some, not many, I have to say, not many, but I have seen some implementation by framework and uh, teams that are similar to this one. So this one, for instance, is coming from Mojo Federation. So you have like the host or, or the container of your uh, microphone tents, and then you have a remote. So, oh, sorry, wrong arrow. So the first thing that you do is, okay, the host is going to load the microphone 10 in, great, all good. But you have also the capability, and it's not the only um, framework that allows you to do that, to do bi-directional sharing. So now the host can also share stuff to the remote. That can be tricky. Because yes, you can find some benefit in the, uh, sh in the short period of time, but there is one thing that we have learned in the hard way. I don't know how many, how many of you have worked in a system where you have to write your uh, MV star architecture. But I, I have worked with uh, MVC, MVVM, MVP, um, uh, and so on, uh, and um, MVI as well. And uh, all of them has uh, um, some kind of uh, bi-directional communication, where if you're not extremely disciplined, uh, you might risk to have stuff that should be in one layer that in reality is put in another layer. And back in the days, if I remember well, it was 2015, um, Facebook came out after React with Flux. How many of you remember Flux? A few of you. So Flux was the first uh, state manager that was available for, uh, uh, for React. And for me, the most important thing that brought here, because it's not too different from an MV star uh, architecture, is the unidirectional data flow. Before every time in the controller or uh, mediator or whatever, you have the capability to exchange bidirectionally uh, the, the system, so it makes extremely hard to debug. And they come out with this idea that the flow of the, the application is always the same. Now, a few years later, we uh, started to see the implementation of uh, model view intent. And in this specific implementation we have seen in, in a reactive fashion, or we have seen, uh, let's say, just with callbacks, there are different ways to handle that. Um, you had the possibility to have, again, a unidirectional data flow. And in this case, for instance, uh, as you can see from here, um, you have like a user that is, uh, create, is making an action that will be picked up by the intent that is understanding what the user wanted to achieve. It will uh, send this uh, input state to the model, change the state, and send the load state into the view, and then the view is going to display the new screen or the new uh, state of the application. That is used on uh, um, Android native Android application. There was in JavaScript a bunch of libraries uh, that, are, uh, uh, that allow you to do that. It's heavily inspired by Elm. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a great uh, uh, way for understanding what's going on. In JavaScript, for instance, the library that I was used to talk about uh, uh, is called CycleJS. Uh, that was a uh, uh, library that was using uh, reactive streams for uh, communicating across all the different parts. And it, it, it is great because uh, it, you know, it provides a couple of interesting things. So first of all, it's easy to debug. If I'm able to, let's say, encapsulate uh, the right logic of the application uh, in the right layer of the application, then it becomes a breeze uh, working with, uh, uh, with that. And there is 
really, um, the, these architectures are less prone to errors because it, you really spot it immediately when something is not in the right position. And because they are less prone to errors, obviously makes the developer's life easier. So in the example that they started in, with this anti-pattern where you are uh, going to, uh, let's say, do bi-directional communication, yes, you might find some benefit at the beginning, but in the long run, it's going to bite you. And I don't want that you arrive at that point. So when I've seen this anti-pattern, there was a large organization that was uh, with uh, tens of developers working on the same uh, UI. And they started to, to go, go extremely granular, bi-directional sharing and all the other things. And then suddenly, six months later, uh, one, they hire a, um, a new engineer and they said, I have no clue how this thing is going to work. I, haven't, I don't know how to put my hands. And they, uh, honestly, it's a big ball of mud. And it was six months in. And then suddenly they spend other three months for removing all the bidirectional communication, going more coarse grain, and following all the suggestions that I collected here. And you know, it's um, um, sometimes can be uh, counterintuitive, uh, but we are, as I said at the beginning, shifting the way how we are building software and distributed system. It's not the same approach that we have with um, uh, monolithic architectures. So try. Try to avoid bidirectional sharing unless it's strictly needed. The next one is uh, relax. It's just code. Or uh, avoid organizational coupling. So in microservices, not on the front end, we have what is called uh, design time coupling. Design time coupling is basically an anti-pattern that says every time that you touch one thing in one place, you affect all the other microservices that are relying on you. And that's the main problem we have uh, with, uh, with microfrontends. I would say that easily 70% of the customers I followed, when they start their journey in microfrontends, I received this question. Should we use a global state for handling our microfrontends? And unfortunately, the answer is no, we shouldn't use it. Because the problem is, if I change something in the global state, and I'm an independent team that is responsible for microfrontend A, and another uh, team, microfrontend B, is, uh, I don't know, changing their, their global state for any given reason, now everyone has to retest, despite it's a change that might uh, not, uh, let's say, directly affect uh, uh, the, the base functionality, but if imagine that these four teams are working independently on the same piece of code and they need to coordinate and they need to do quite a lot of stuff, you start to have a very quickly a, a mess. And we said before that the micro front end is different from a component, so the state has to be inside the micro front end. How do you communicate usually? But there are several ways to do that. Uh, you can use custom events, you can use event emitter, uh, you can use reactive streams. My favorite at the moment is event, uh, event emitter, and I explain why. So uh, with reactive streams, you need to be in the reactive world. You need to understand uh, uh, how, what you can do with reactive uh, um, um, streams and how to manage that. And usually I've seen uh, in, in the past that the developers struggle a bit for understanding the, the reactive programming concept. It could be, uh, at the beginning, a bit nasty to understand. In uh, custom events, you are bounded to the DOM. So in terms of that, imagine that you have two branches inside your DOM. And then these two branches, you have one microphone then very nested inside one, one, uh, one branch that has to send a, an event up to the chain. The event has to reach the window of object, but the event is bubbling across the DOM. So if someone is intercepting that and prevent to go to the, um, to the window of object, then good luck to finding what is the problem there. And therefore, event emitter instead is an implementation that usually is around 17, 20 lines of code, nothing too crazy. And the beauty of that is, is uh, basically um, uh, or based on, on the uh, publish subscribe pattern where you just have uh, a uh, emit uh, function and uh, um, on or listen, depends from the library you're using, uh, function. And what it does every time that you call emit is, go, is looping through all the people that subscribe uh, to events and they're just sending this event. Who is interested, it will pick it up. Who is not, doesn't matter, discard it. 
And the beauty of this is that you are really the couple in this case. You don't care if someone is not listening. If in the f also, if you start to send events and the microphone dance is not there yet, nothing will happen. You just have like an event that is bubbling around the system and no one will do anything. Then you have a new microphone tender speaking it up, boom, you have it there. You don't have to coordinate with uh, multiple teams. You start to have really uh, a system that is starting to be loosely coupled but highly aligned. The next one is uh, uh, let's hammer the APIs. And that is uh, an interesting one. This one, I to be honest with you, I didn't foresee happening. But it happens more than once, so I thought, OK, it's fair to, to share it. So imagine a situation like that. So you have multiple microphone tenders in the same view. And now, suddenly, uh, you have the bottom ones that are calling exactly the same API. It's interesting because you say, oh, yeah, but it's just an API. It's not a big deal. Let's see in a distributed system, because it's likely that if you have micro, microphone tents, you have microservices on the other side. Let's see how it's going to work. So you have two calls, and usually in microservices, you need to expose it somehow. So it could be a load balancer, it could be an API gateway. Let's speak for the sake of this example, API gateway. Usually, at the entry point in, of your application, not always, but usually, uh, you have uh, the authorization service that is uh, plugged into the API gateway, so you authenticate the request and authorize the request, no problem at all. And now, finally, you reach your API. Sorry, it's a distributed system. And then that API has to retrieve synchronously or synchronously, doesn't matter, uh, information from other APIs, unless I have the cache, but then it, it creates complication. Now, it's all fancy and dandy up to here. The problem is, if I have a spiky traffic, like let's assume that you move from 1,000 requests per second to half a million. Now, it's a million requests per second to handle. The cost that you're going to have inside your infrastructure is going to surge dramatically because you didn't do properly the design of your system. Now, alternatives of this. So you have uh, different ways to handle this. You can uh, uh, take the initial solution and say, but probably if we're making the same call, let's see and let's go back to the whiteboard and see if we can, uh, let's say, uh, create a unique mic front end and, uh, let's say, have a unique team following this part. That could be a solution. I've seen that. It's a bit painful because it means that you went too granular uh, and, and too early, uh, and therefore now you probably need to sanitize some code, maybe thrown away some code, and so on and so forth. Or if you really, really need to maintain the independence of the two teams because these two elements are very complex, you can use components. Because the reality, we have said that before, the components are leaking their domain uh, towards the container. So we can have a microphone tent that has two components, and those two components can be nicely orchestrated and communicating wherever, and they, the microphone tent takes care of making the request towards the API and inject through dependency injection, through whatever you want, uh, reactive streams or whatever, uh, into the, the components for updating and render the new view. Absolutely something that, that you can do. But remember, the most important thing is never just an API call. It's always understanding how end-to-end -end, uh, your system will behave in a such a scenario. Now, last but not least, the bye-bye Big Bang. So I have uh, lost my count on how many systems I have seen. Uh, that they uh, were trying to, so the developer teams uh, was trying to, let's say, build in parallel a new version of the application, but that requires like a month. So you go to your business and you say, oh, I, I, I want to rewrite the entire application because it has the, um, we lose velocity, it's a big ball of mud, and so on and so forth. So now you have to have the buy-in from the management for a system, uh, sorry, for building a system uh, that might require, I don't know, 10 months or whatever. So it's a big ask. And therefore, let's talk about migration strategy. When you have something like that, like a monolithic architecture, and you want to move on something like that, the only way to do that is iteratively. Don't even start selling the, the dream of, oh, yes, but in 10 months, 
everything will work because you will find yourself in, oh yeah, but we cannot do feature freeze. Oh, but we, we have to introduce this feature imme uh, immediately because we have this new deal that we cut, stuff like that. You cannot see the future, so therefore try to, instead of fighting the change, embrace them. And therefore, what you can do is starting to look on migration strategy. My big, uh, let's say, uh, suggestion when you do this is start small and then start to iterate. Usually, when you start for, for a migration, moving from a monolithic architecture to a, a, a microphone 10 one, um, start with the, the, the easiest way. So you control a specific uh, page uh, that has one or multiple microphone tens, and then you route through that page, and there are techniques for doing that. In fact, you could do something like that and pick it up at, uh, I don't know, uh, Nginx level or uh, Edge level, depends what, what, how your application is structured, but you can pick it up um, and say everything is going to the monolithic version, but the, the catalog, no. The catalog will start in this way. And, and we'll go to, to the microphone tense implementation. So I can assemble a team that is big enough for developing my uh, subdomain, and they are capable to develop this and going end to end. Because what you're going to learn, and that is not applicable only on microphone tense, what you're going to learn from uh, um, uh, operationalizing a distributed system is invaluable. You will you we start with a certain automation pipeline, you will start with certain beliefs, library, and whatever, and during the journey you're going to update them. It's inevitable. And therefore, slowly but steadily, you start to arrive in something like that. But in the meantime, you have, let's say, your monolith uh, that maybe is not fully future, but is working, is providing value to the company. At the same time, you have the brand new application, heavily optimized, working with microphone tens, working with multiple teams, and you start on board team after team towards that. I described, so when I was a customer of uh, AWS, uh, I was on the stage of the main, uh, the main event uh, where uh, I explained this journey of migration and uh, how we handled uh, using, uh, um, we, were, we have like a client-side rendering application, we were using Lambda at the edge. Uh, and the, the beauty of this approach is that we were capable uh, to uh, really unlock few capabilities, because what, we were, what I was thinking back in the days is, if I'm capable to redirect the user towards the old, ver old world and the new world, it means that I can also shape the traffic of the new world. And what I mean with that, it means that I can start to have, uh, let's say, uh, practices that are quite common on microservices, like canary releases, blue-green deployment, stuff like that. And therefore, I use the Lambda the Edge as a strangler pattern and as, uh, let's say, um, test for, for new version of the application. Now, I tell you one thing. When we started to do um, uh, this uh, implementation, I remember clearly the first week when uh, a team has the possibility to test this, this out. And we moved from four the deployment per month to with one team that was the first one trying that, 25 per day. They remove completely the rollback. Now they, they roll only forward. So if there is a bug, they just shift the traffic back. And they were capable to instruct the Lambda the Edge to say, I want to ship the new version of the microphone 10 only in this country, only for this browser, only 5% of the traffic. And they have information directly from live traffic. Now, not happy with that. Uh, last year, I started this, uh, uh, this work with a bunch of uh, colleagues um, on uh, building a solution that allows you to, to handle that. It's completely open source. It's not a service of AWS. You can go on this link and download it. It's available on GitHub. You can fork it. You can change it. You do whatever you want. But the idea is, I want to democratize this capability. The fact that we are deploying um, our uh, front-end application, single-page application, server-side rendering, micro-front-end, you name it, uh, in a big bag fashion has to end. We need to create, uh, uh, let's say, a safe net for developers that will allow them to uh, achieve, uh, uh, let's say, the same capabilities we have uh, with uh, uh, microservices. And for microphone tents, really, really matters. And if you want to know more, here I have done uh, a live stream with a colleague of mine, uh, Julian Wood, uh, during the serverless office hour, because the solution is fully serverless. So you pay for what you use and nothing more. 
Uh, and uh, where I, I describe basically and was showing a full functioning demo on how to do canary releases and blue-green deployment with front-end. And uh, uh, I can tell you that there was there were quite few people reached. We start to have the first customers that uh, uh, are using this, this solution in production, uh, and uh, it was announced uh, a couple of months ago, actually. So remember, when you work with microfrontends, leverage the modularity that you start to have at, um, uh, in the infrastructure level, because now you are shifting from a modularity that in monolithic is expressed with design patterns into modularity, hard modularity that is happening when you slice your system, and therefore you can leverage in a different way how you would do with uh, a monolithic architecture. Last but not least, there isn't right or wrong in architecture. And therefore, you remember that it's always a trade-off. The most important thing is that you need to understand your context. There are certain things that maybe I mentioned here that I, uh, that I uh, set or listed as an anti-pattern that fits perfectly a specific use case. So patterns and anti-patterns are just suggestions of common situation. Now, it's obvious that you are not going to have uh, always uh, edge case. But sometimes, if you have strong argument and you can, let's say, uh, uh, visit them, uh, revisit them, and make sure that uh, uh, you know your specific situation and context fit into that, apply an anti-pattern. No one will scream because you have like a good way to describe it. That. That's all I got. I hope that you enjoyed the session, and thanks for being part of this last talk of the conference. We have nine minutes, so we have questions, times, if you want. Okay. Otherwise, you have nine minutes back. Nine minutes back. Eight minutes. Fifty. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, then. Thank <laughs> you.